Hi guys and welcome back to VR Essentials where we talk about the practical uses of virtual reality today. Very exciting video in episode 4 season 1 of Meta Business Podcast where you can learn all the ins and outs and the behind the scenes of the business aspect of the metaverse. We've been joined by the lead developer and creator of Samurai Slaughterhouse, a really awesome up and coming VR title created by Tab Games. And of course do go and check out the previous episodes as we talk to the lead developer and creator of Walkabout Mini Golf, the guys behind Synth Riders and more. So do make sure you enable the bell after you subscribe so you can be notified of next week's and also future episodes. Oh, wow. Without further ado, by the way, timestamps in the description below so you can skip to any questions that you want to go and find the answer to. But without further ado, as I mentioned, let's roll the tape. Uh, so Justin, well, uh, by the way, thank you very much for, for taking the call because I know you said it was late uh, where, where you are. So Thanks again for that. Um, so tell me a little bit more, Justin, uh, how, how did you start your journey before you you got into VR? Like what, what was the progression for you? So I've, I've been making video games for a really long time. I started when I was probably about 10 or 11 oh, yeah, wow. with uh, basic engines like uh, Click and Play, which was one that you know kind of made it easy to make games, but you're still able to use Logic and also uh, RPG Maker people are familiar with. So I kind of started with that. Um, as I got older, I kind of uh, played around with different more engines, and uh, I kind of got away from it for a while. But then recently, a couple years ago, uh, I started decided to get back into making games. So I started off. I wanted to so, make so a wait, game. So wait, 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 wait! You, you started off as making games, and then you stopped for a while. How long is a while, and why did you stop? So when I was about uh, about eighteen, I had. And this is why I back everything up now. I had everything on an external hard drive, and that hard drive just died, and I lost like everything. Oh dear! And, and then, um, yeah, and I just kind of didn't start up again for a good, good seven, eight years. But <laughs> you were you were so gutted. You're like, oh no, my my ten years worth of work gone. No way am I doing this ever again. Yeah, and um, there was just nothing really that I had that inspired me to get back into it. Um, right. And then what, what actually did years later, and I, you know, between that, I did art and music and other things. So I still did creative stuff. But uh, what kind of inspired me to get back into it, oddly, was I found out that the Doom engine used to make like Doom and a bunch of other games was open source. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you know, I love like how the 3D looks with the sprites. So I started making a game with that. And, uh, you know, they don't make games like that anymore. And there's a reason it's <laughs> kind of difficult. Everything, if you want to make the UI, you have to scale everything by pixels and, it was wow. just getting complicated and then right around that time when i was getting into it and realizing how complex it was they had a humble bundle had like a whole thing of like unity tutorials so i was like yeah hey, why not try mm -hmm. it out so i'm like oh wow this is this is way easier like things scale automatically so i started getting into unity and around the same time i picked up an oculus quest and i was already into pc gaming so when i got the quest i got to mainly do pc vr and I just fell in love with VR, and that's what like really made me like, okay, let's let's take this serious now. And uh, from there, I started making prototyping a couple of games. I started making a, a roguelike game where the idea was going to be mainly a shooter, and mm -hmm. then I started adding like melee weapons. And the melee weapons didn't work well with the shooting, but I was like, hey, these mm -hmm. melee weapons look really cool. And at the same time, I was kind of experimenting with different visual styles for the roguelike, kind of for different uh, zones to have different looks. And I came up with like that this black and white manga look. It looked like a comic. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And then, so I had this you know melee system that was kind of you know not meshing well with that. And I had this cool comic book look. And the roguelike, it was just kind of getting too too convoluted, too big and complex. So I was like, let me take a step back from that and start a little simpler. And so I'm like, you know, melee comic book look. You know, where are we gonna go from there? Of course, samurai. So <laughs> from there, that's when I started prototyping uh, the Samurai Slaughterhouse game. When before you started uh, to do some VR experiences, uh, how long was the transition before between when you started uh, doing 3D games on PC again when you when you had started again and then transition into into VR? Was it a few weeks, a few months, or a few years? Yeah, probably like a few months, maybe like five, six months. Um, when I first started playing about Unity, I kind of made a couple of quick little physics games just to play right. around with it. And then um, I started uh, doing like kind of like a, a sci-fi game that I was going to make like mm -hmm. the roguelike one. And then right. from there, I kind of dragged in a VR 
uh, rig and kind of made it into like a VR game. So yeah, probably like five, six months I played around before I started moving. So what, what, what happened to, to that uh, sci-fi, sci-fi experience? So that roguelike game, I still have it on hold. Um, now that I've learned like a lot more doing this game, mm -hmm. when, I, when I do, I'm ready to go back to that, I'm going to kind of overhaul a lot of things. But yeah, I still have it all ready to go, kind of like a system already set up to generate random mazes. Mm -hmm. And I have like a little bit of a weapon and an AI system, but that's probably... And a lot of the stuff from that kind of made it over into Samurai Slaughterhouse, like the mm -hmm. AI. That was like the basis for it, and everything has kind of been improved on from there. Right. But, uh, and, but yeah. and, and, and when you when you started to learn uh, Unity, how, how easy or, or tough was it for you to uh, get used to, you know, everything? And, and how did you go about... Uh, learning learning it so yeah it wasn't too hard um i didn't have a lot of experience in unity specifically but just from you know even using those tools like rpg maker and things like that even though you're not writing code and you're still using logic writing like the algorithm so a lot of that kind of came over kind of came natural and uh there is a little bit of like a learning curve learning uh you know how to you know get access to different variables that you need things like that but uh, overall, it wasn't too hard. I did do some uh, tutorials. Um, there was one I like called Zenva Academy, which is uh, just like a one that you can pay for and do classes on. Um, Udemy is another good website where you can go and find classes. And uh, if anyone wanting to learn, I do encourage you to, to spend $10, $15 on a class. That little bit of money will save you so much time over going through YouTube. Because um, yeah, YouTube videos are great. Um, for doing like quick specific things, but if you need to learn like a lot of information, it's going to be hard to to go through YouTube and pick out things here and there. It's easier if you have like a set course, at least for like the beginning stuff. Right. So basically, what you're saying is that YouTube has a lot of individual tutorials to learn one thing or two, but if you want to connect the dots, uh, that's when things start to get a little bit more complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and did you learn, uh, because it sounds like you, you learn how to do coding from a young age. So uh, did, you, did you also go to school? I mean, how did you, what languages did you learn and how did you learn them? So, um, yeah, using like RPG Maker, I learned how to code a little bit using that. And then... Um, but what was that? Was that? Uh, sorry, I'm not familiar with RPG code. I'm so sorry. Uh, so RPG Maker, it's like... Um, <laughs> RPG Maker, sorry. Yeah, it's like a program where you, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. You use it to make RPGs and kind of a lot of things are set up for you, but you are able to do logic in it. And the way they have it, instead of you typing a code, like for instance, um, a lot of uh, code you'll use like if-else statements. So they will say like right. if, um, you know, the player has this item, do this. If not, mm -hmm. do this. So instead of typing if and not, you're able to just click like if else statement and it kind of puts those there and then you click in there and you kind of click the chunks of code that you want to put in. Right. So you're not right. typing it yourself, but you're still learning how to use functions from that. So, you know, some people kind of look down on that tool, but it really is like a good way to learn and like you could do cool things with it, like if you get into it. And uh, yeah, so from that, I learned, you know, kind of just a little bit of the logic behind it. Um, I did take one coding course in college, which was mainly like Java focused which um, now, I guess there's still things they use Java for, but it's kind of like outdated use of this knowledge now. Yeah. Um, and then from there, yeah, like I said, when I started using, making um, like Doom, Mop, Doom Maps mm -hmm. or, you know, Doom mm -hmm. Wads or what the files are called, um, that has a language that's based off C or C Sharp, so it's very similar to C Sharp. So when I switched from right. that to Unity, um, Unity is based off C Sharp, so that was mostly the same thing. You had to put like a parentheses here and there that you didn't need to before, but... That was right. more or less the same code that they used for Doom. And you, I mean, you said you you had stopped uh, doing game stuff. So, well, was it hard to go back in time to remember all this kind of stuff? I mean, how do you manage to remember all those things that you had learned in the past if if you stopped for for an amount of time? So a lot of it, it wasn't specific things that I needed to remember, but just kind of the skills I learned because you learn how to think in think in the algorithm. So you know, you know, right. I want this to do this. This is what I need to check first. So those kind of basic skills, even though you don't remember the exact code and the wording mm -hmm. and everything, those kind of things, that, you know, it's kind of stick in your brain. So when you start relearning it again, it just kind of comes back to you naturally. And um, for me, returning to game, you know, making games, it just felt felt right. It felt great, like right what I needed to do. Right. <laughs> when you went into, we uh, had you given a try to develop games for mobile application as well? Or did you purely go from PC to VR? Yeah, I pretty much really went from PC to VR. One of the first games that I did um, make, just like to fool around with Unity, did actually, 
I, I was planning to maybe release it on mobile, but I ended up not doing it. But I did, like, adapt the controls for it. Uh, but, yeah, pretty much um, went from, like, PC to, to VR. And uh, so was it was it quite easy for you to uh, adapt the code that you learned? Because a lot of people, perhaps, uh, you know, they don't really understand what it takes to do stuff in VR. Now, maybe you can talk to us a little bit more about the differences between creating a game uh you know uh, on pc and in vr as a lot of the skills that you had learned uh were they transferable to to the vr or did you have to learn a whole ton of new things that had nothing to do uh with pc gaming development yeah most of it did actually transfer over and uh you'd be surprised if you have a game that you're already making that's not a vr game it really doesn't take too much to adapt it to vr um there are, you know, a few, you know, differences that are significant. For instance, like in VR, you have to think about um, UI is usually real, you know, more complicated than on a flat screen. You have to think about where you're going to put the options, how the players are going to choose it. Um, some things are easier in VR though, because you're making a flat game. You know, you need to have animations for everything the player does. But when you're in VR, the uh, the player is controlling that the whole player, so you don't need to worry about animating them, things like that. You just need to worry about hand poses or. You know, if you have those disappearing invisible hands, you don't even have to worry about that. So it's, you know, a, a different mix of challenges. But definitely, if you already have the skills for flat, like almost almost all of it will carry over. Right. And and you mentioned for UI. So for text, you still use text mesh and all those kind of things? Or is it different tools that are used for? Because you, we'll, we'll talk about your game very briefly. But for your experience, uh, you know, you developed both on Steam and also for the Facebook Quest. So... Uh, do they provide tools that, you know, would mean that you wouldn't have to use the original tools from Unity? I mean, it's not that they're different tools from Unity, but just the, the things that come with the plugins, I guess. Or do you still use the, the Unity panel stuff to create the same stuff? Yeah, you use pretty much all the same stuff. You still use, um, like, TextMesh Pro. You know, well, you got to use TextMesh Pro if you're in VR because right. um, <laughs> it's anything... It looks okay on the flat, but when you blow it up, it's going to look pixelated as heck if you're not on text mesh right. Pro. Um, but yeah, same thing. And you still use canvases. Um, you just use the only different thing is instead of the player clicking the buttons, you use uh, like a, a, a canvas ray caster. So you just set that up. But basically, once you have it all set up, you just put Unity buttons on there, just like you would with the flat UI. Uh, right. but yeah, almost, almost everything will transfer over. If you are on the Quest, um, which I have, I've only played around with a little bit. I've kind of been more focusing on PC VR. But from what I understand, having a lot of canvases on there is not good for it. So sometimes they've found like alternate ways of doing that. Like they'll actually put textures that, that change to show like lettering if, it, if the, the canvas has to change a lot. But uh, yeah, for the most part, everything is still the same set of tools that you're going to be using. Everything will transfer over. So how long did it take you to learn? Uh... How, because you, you had to learn both for the Quest and also for Steam. So did you? is it very, very different? Is it apples and oranges when you're trying to create a VR experience for, for both different platforms? Or is it actually very similar in, in many ways? So <laughs> this, is, this is a good thing for people to know if you're just starting a brand new game, is that if you ahead of time plan to, to be go targeting both PC VR and Oculus Quest, it's uh it's very easy because there's um, OpenXR will work for both. Um, I use the one that I purchased called Hurricane VR, which does a lot of the things for you. It's really great. I think it's like seventy dollars, but it's definitely worth it. It does dynamic hand posing, all kinds of other stuff. But those tools, um, with the click of a button, you can switch it from Quest to being for Steam VR. But oh, okay. It will change you your code. Yeah, yeah. It'll um, it, it'll just uh, it actually just changes and you said whether you're targeting Android or targeting PC. So right. that you just hit it on, on uh, the on Unity, you hit that switch over and you let your computer sit for like a half hour while it changes it. But <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not too hard. But if you're just starting out and you make your game using the Steam VR SDK, that works great in Steam and everything has all these great tools, but that will not work on the Quest. Right. And, uh, same thing if you download the Oculus VR SDK, I think it's called. Um, that will work on the Quest and it'll also work on the PC um, Oculus app, like if you did want to publish mm -hmm. on that for some weird reason. <laughs> um, but that will not publish to Steam. So if you start off you know, with one of those, then you're going to have a pretty hard thing done in time because um, things like how you grab things and how you mm -hmm. uh, 
press buttons while you're holding things, those are all kind of integrated into those packages. So it makes it difficult. You have to redo all those interactions. But if you so, use a tool that's, you know, compatible with both, then it's no problem at all. Well, what would you recommend to someone who wants to learn how to transfer from PC to VR to learn for the Facebook Quest first or uh, for Steam VR? Uh, I would probably recommend targeting the Quest just because that's the good business decision. That's what everyone's right. using. So right. um, just from a business perspective, I would recommend that. Uh, it is a little more difficult optimizing for it. Uh, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. But yeah, if you start off with a open VR, um, and then there's also a, a thing you call uh, VR toolkit or something where there's, the icon is like a flying pig. But mm -hmm. I know that um, that works with OpenXR. So if you're using that, that'll work with the Quest and with the Steam. Uh, but yeah, if you are going to get into it, I would probably recommend going with the Quest because that's that's where the money's at right now. But but I understand that uh, OpenXR is yet to be fully accessible uh, uh, on on Unity, right? So. And I know a lot of people are really, you know, anticipating it uh, to come out. Is it a tool that you think once it's out, you would definitely just use straight away? Or do you think it's going to take some time before uh, the industry will, you know, I mean, you probably talk to a lot of other developers uh, in, in your net of the corner. What, what's, what's your take on uh, OpenXR? Yeah, I think OpenXR is a great system and uh, you actually can already use it right now, uh, but it, Think you have to download the oculus vr kit with it but if you build using it it's not that hard to switch over back and forth uh but yeah i think that's that's gonna just be the standard for everyone because why not just have one system that works everywhere because that, that that works with the oculus stuff and it works with steam vr it's kind of like a one size fits all so i think it's definitely everyone's so so in the programmers programmers world is that definitely something that you guys are all excited about and feel that it would be the go-to development tool, a rendering rendering tool, I guess. Is it is it a rend OpenXR is more of a rendering uh, kind of solution, right? Because that's how that would be the output uh, of the game, right? Yeah, and also handles all the tracking, like uh, when you push buttons and things like that. How it knows where it's coming from, which is kind of handy if you're having, uh, you know, if you're developing for PC, not everyone has the Oculus Full or something, right. like the wands, the index controllers. So it handles all the inputs. And also, um, you know, if you don't have something like this, like I'm working with like an experimental like VR hardware where they had to set this up from scratch. Mm -hmm. But when you have your Vive trackers and everything, uh, that actually has to calculate based on the position of the, uh, the, little, the little things that you mount up, the sensors that you mount up there. So Open XR, it kind of does all that, those calculations for you. So you can just pop in and say, hey, where's the hand at? And it'll tell you. So when you learned VR, did you, did you, how, how do you go about learning? You, you went online again, you took some courses and then you, I guess that's where your, sci your first sci-fi experience come from. It came from the stuff you were learning or I mean, how, how did you learn, uh, how to get into VR? Yeah, how exactly. To... I went into, uh, Udemy and YouTube were kind of my two sources, but there is a, yeah, a couple of tutorials I did on there. I kind of followed along and made the kind of sample game that they recommended with it. And then, um, yeah, I started making that roguelike game. But yeah, if you go on there, um, Udemy, there's a guy, his name is um, Tefik, is it, I believe is his name. But he has uh, two different VR, you know, based tutorials. One is a regular one, the other one's a multiplayer one. But those are great ones. When you go through it, he shows you how to, uh, uh, like, open the VR TK from the OpenXR and everything. And uh, just to get started, it's really not that hard. You can just drag what's called like a prefab, like already made, like rig put together, and you mm -hmm. can have something running in, you know, Unity within, you know, with a matter of minutes. So it's uh, definitely not too hard to get started, and you just kind of build up from there. Cool. And uh, okay, so you said you, you you started off with the Facebook Quest, so that so you already knew when you were starting VR that. Uh, you wanted to create something down the line that was commercially viable. Is that why you decided to start to learn using the Facebook Quest first? Uh, I'm gonna have to and not PC right. VR? I, you know, I want to say, I, I think the reason for it was that uh, the, the tutorial that I saw, it was a really good one, it had five stars, and it happened to be focused on like the Quest, like using the Oculus VR. And so I went through that and I learned how to use that. And then... Uh, from there, I was like, what am I doing? I really want to do Steam VR because that's what I like. So then I learned 
the Steam VR SDK. And then um, from there, like, you know, that was good. Like, I learned about it. And then that's when I ended up purchasing the Hurricane one, which is, like, the, the better upgraded one. Uh, but, yeah, it was just kind of coincidence that the tutorial, the first tutorial I did was focus on the quest. So I just followed along with it. What, what were some of the things that you felt were quite tough to learn when you went into uh into learning more about how to develop a game for for vr and, and how did you uh f you know go past that like did you st did you have a moment where you just went oh no i can't do this it's uh you know and uh, but then you found a way to to move forward yeah so that I, i've had a couple of moments like that <laughs> but um yeah one of the hard things about it is um when i when i switched over to steam vr and I, I like the Steam VR SDK for, for what it is. And it is free, you know, which is nice as opposed to paying for it. But um, there's there's documentation, but there's not like a ton of it there. There's not a lot of instructions. So I had this issue where it, it turned out I, I wasn't supposed to have like a, a teleport prefab in more than one scene. So it was just causing like characters fingers to flip inside out and weird things. So I think that's kind of the one of the harder parts is uh, if you pick a SDK like the Steam VR one where there's not mm -hmm. a lot of documentation, you're gonna have like a tougher time. But if you do pick like the Open VR or Open XR, uh, there is like a lot more documentation out there, which is a big help. Uh, by the way, are there any other any of the uh, games that you had developed before on PC? Is there a way for us to go and check those out? Uh, you know, not right now, but I am going to launch a Patreon Why starting. Not? <laughs> So the ones before the hard drive are gone. Those are gone. And oh, uh, they're gone. They're not uh, online. There's a, there's a oh, couple on okay. my. Uh, well, I don't know if my old Angel Fire. I don't know if anyone's been making websites forever and knows what Angel Fire is. <laughs> but I had an old one there, and they were mostly like Pokemon fan games because I was like 12 years old and I made these. But um, yeah, some of the other ones that I made in Unity because I'm going to start a Patreon on 915. And so cool. in addition to putting like the in progress Samurai Slaughterhouse, like my main mm -hmm. game, I'm going to put. Uh, the other games that I made up on there. So if people want to try them and if anyone is, you know, really likes them, I might develop those a little bit more too. Uh, yeah, I'll eventually have them to try. But by, by the way, uh, just off topic a little bit, did, did you want to try augmented reality? Was that something you you thought would be, you want to try, but then you, dis you decided not to? And if so, why not? So for, you know, for a long time, it didn't really interest me. And, um, I mean, I've seen some cool stuff with it. I know, like, the 3DS had, like, a really cool, like, augmented reality game that it came with. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, whenever I've seen augmented reality, it's always kind of like, oh, you spin the camera around and you're shooting at, like, balloons or something. So I just never really saw anything that interests me. But now with the uh, Oculus Quest pass-through, I've seen some kind of neat things. And um, I think it's not to the level yet where you can have, like, uh, kind of the real world interacting with objects. Like, I think it's just too much for the Quest to process. But I was thinking it would be cool um you know i think in my game where you're fighting with people with a sword if you had like a little mini game where you're all of a sudden in your actual room and there's guys coming out at you mm -hmm. like so yeah i think I, I wouldn't mind playing around with it a little bit but uh i don't well, know like, if i would I, kind of make a fool game in it <laughs> i guess that's what we would call mixed reality because you have the vr plus the plus the augmented uh, reality but also theo uh the difference is that with uh, augmented reality you can't really interact with i mean augmented reality is you you see the actual objects in front of you but you can't really interact with them but with mixed reality uh especially with um uh hand tracking uh you'll be able to actually play around with the objects and move them around uh which would be more of a mixed reality interactive uh, experience that that perhaps would be more of a interesting thing to work with because if you're just looking at something and you can't really physically interact with them I and mean, you're someone yeah. who's in gaming so you're probably more interesting about uh how to get people engaged with your experience as opposed to just uh, having a viewing uh experience w would that be correct yeah absolutely i would definitely anything i may i would want to make games um i have a little bit of story and telling skills but not enough just to make that the media like definitely my skills are making things fun and interactive so um now of course uh the time of this recording and by the time it will be released uh there might be you know some time difference there so but at the moment at the time of this recording uh you're working of course on a very cool app um uh, 
you know, Samurai Slaughterhouse. Now, even though, you know, it's not out yet, there's no download button at the moment to try anything out. And we're not quite sure where you are at this moment in time, which, you know, we'll get to know more about that from you. Um, but, you know, it's already grabbing people's interest. And I think that's really cool. That's, that's really interesting. Um, and, you know, there is another VR app that came out, which has a similar uh, style in terms of its look. But of course, its gameplay is, is different. It's a completely different app. But I thought it was very sy synchronous. Uh, I mean, the synchro the, um, it, it's very funny how, you know, sometimes things happen when some things just get released at the same time and, you know, you're completely world apart and perhaps you don't know each other even and stuff like that. Uh, you might know the app I'm, I'm referring to. I don't know if you, you do, but... Yeah, it's... I think it's something about like a blind samurai and you're like slashing at uh, like characters, like a like kanji character. Is that the one or...? Uh, it's it's the one called uh, Against. I, I don't know if you, you... You can go online and, and research it yourself as well. Um, but basically, fun. it has a very similar style in terms of its look. Okay, so that means a black and white kind of feel, but that's about it. That's the only thing that, you know, I just thought it was very interesting because there's a lot of apps, uh, a lot of VR games, VR experiences in VR today, uh, you know, more than 300, it'd be safe to say that, um, you know, that are on market, you know, those that we actually can play. Uh, there's probably more of those in experimental modes, uh, but none of them that I know of that are remotely known anyway to me, uh, have a black and white kind of experience. Uh, most of everyone else is focused purely on color. Um, so it's it's quite funny how you have two apps that come up at the same, more or less at the same time, um, you know, that, that focus more on the black and white kind of genre, although noir, we call it noir uh, kind of genre. Um, so that's quite cool. So tell me a little bit more about, you know, how, how did the idea for you to develop a game going with that art direction uh, came about what what were some of your inspirations uh you know from movies or comics or whatever um that that gave you the inspiration to want to go in that direction uh so yeah probably my biggest inspiration um was just kind of manga in general like and then i used to like reading was one when i was small called like shonen jump and it would come out i think weekly or bi-weekly and it would have like Dragon Ball and like Ronin Kenshin and like Inuyasha, like all the different like comics. It would have like uh, maybe like I think like ten pages for each one. And hey, Inuyasha kind of... is excellent. Oh yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> Great inspiration. So yeah, I would kind of you know like how flipping through that and you get kind of like a bunch of different stories. And that was kind of like the inspiration, you know, when I first started it, that I wanted it to be kind of like a a love letter to all those different like animes and mangas, and so. That's how I kind of started off with that, um, kind of just like black and white. It was, I was first going for like 100% like comic book style. And then uh, a little bit later, I was kind of experimenting, you know, what I want to do with the skyboxes. So I had it kind of black with like just white clouds. And then um, that's when I started kind of looking at the uh, ukiyo, ukiyo like those the Japanese paintings uh, with right. the kind of like subtle like watercolors. And I put mm -hmm. that in the skybox and then I started kind of incorporating that into the look and then it that's when I think it kind of really came together is when I combined those two to kind of get it complete. So when you put your headset on for the first time trying that VR experience, um, because you would develop, okay, I know that when you develop in VR, you go back and forth, uh, yeah. you know, from your computer, but but how, how did you really, like, what, what was the emotion like when you, you, okay, you're done on your PC, and all right, time's for my headset on to just look around. How, how did it, did it, give you what you expected how did you feel when you put your headset on for the first time it did like it um it's kind of crazy because you're making something like on the flat screen you look at you kind of like you know this is how it's going to look and then when you hop in it like the first time i hopped in i was like holy cow like this is this is awesome like it it looks like i've been a comic book because I, I had never seen any vr games use like the cell shade near the outline right. so i was like is this even going to look right in vr like how is it going to look and i hopped in and i'm like oh it looks it looks like I'm in a cartoon, like I'm in a comic, and it it kind of blew my mind the first time. Like even though I made it, like just how it how it all came together and how it looked, I was like, wow, like we're we're onto something. <laughs> so all right, that's that's what I was going to ask you. So you you already felt that moment of all right, I'm onto something. I got I got to continue on this thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's good. When when I saw how it looked, and then um, 
I bought I set up like the blood effect at almost the same time. So when I saw how that red the, the what effect on, the the blood <laughs> oh the blood effect okay yep yeah yeah and that's like the the thing that's not that was the first thing to not be in black and white and I saw how that just looked on the the black and white I'm like oh yeah this this just looks great. <laughs> Actually, you reminded me of Tarantino, uh, your, your app a lot, because he yeah. kind of goes with those kind of feels, I think. Yeah, with Kill Bill, that was like kind of a big inspiration. I know there was um, kind of like a few of those scenes where you just see like the silhouettes of the characters like slashing, right. and there's the, the scene where they're in the snow and like the blood splatters on it and it has that high contrast. So, yeah, I definitely drew inspiration from, from his films. So when when before you when you started this thing did you okay you obviously had some kind of planning uh, did did you plan stuff out or did you just go on a whim I mean how how do you plan this this VR experience and and is it going along your plan or has it completely deviated from it Yeah and this um, if anyone's looking there's probably not the best way to make a game but yeah I did kind of just roll with it and just um, the initial idea. And this is probably the best way to start a game is to start off with the simplest idea. Initially, it was going to be like Time Crisis, but with swords. That was my idea. So you're going to fight, you know, a couple of people, and then it moves you to a next spot, and more people kind of spawn out. Um, and then from there, I kind of graduated from there. I turned that into, instead of it being, uh, you know, specific spots you have to go to, it's like a grid, and you kind of teleport to which ones you go to. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, People tolerated that, but they didn't really like it. I found a lot of people don't like having to teleport. They like smooth motion. Right, so I kind right. of had this weird system where I combined it, where you teleport the tiles, but once the combat started, you had smooth motion. And um, it, it was just kind of like a, a weird concept. So I was like, this is... And, and just setting up those tiles, too, was really like time-consuming. So you have to put a tile everywhere and set up spawn points and everything. So um, from there, I decided, you know, let me just kind of take it back, make it a, a more like just traditional kind of action adventure type game. And um, from there, I just kind of scrapped everything and started over again from the beginning almost. <laughs> and that's when I, uh, I'm like, you know, I'm kind of restarting this. I might as well restart other things. That's when I bought the Hurricane VR from the Unity Asset Store, which helped uh, with, you know, making objects like kind of get stabbed and things get stuck in them. Like it added a lot of cool new features. So I kind of restart over from scratch but because i had a better idea and because i did spend those months you know making that first prototype like the second time through just went way faster way smoother my code was way cleaner like and it, it was great so you know if anyone if you're starting a game and it's just a mess and you're thinking like oh this is this is a mess like don't be afraid to just kind of do a second start over like it'll just go way faster than your first time through and probably turn out way better <laughs> When when you started again, then did you go okay? Because obviously, I, I I it sounds to me like you're trying to find a way to get from A to B as fast as possible and also uh, as easily as as more fluid as possible. So did you then decide okay uh, today this week I'm going to work on uh, this scene and this is what's going to be incorporated in it, or again did you just go all right let me just try something and then it just evolves from there. Yeah, so there's a few things. Uh, it's a little bit of both. There are some things where you have an idea and then you try it and you're like, yeah, this kind of works, but let me change this. Um, but yeah, kind of for the most part, once I started it the second time, I kind of had a more clear vision, at least as far as like the action. I still wasn't sure how I was going to do like the kind of gameplay loop and progress, but uh, yeah, I would just kind of start it on that. And usually the way I do it, if it's something uh, major, I'll, I'll schedule weekends, what I'm going to do on that weekend. So if it's like, you know, the inventory system or like the menus, I'll kind of get that done in one weekend because I have a good chunk of time. And then whatever's not done there, I'll go during the week. And then during the week when I just have time to sit down and do little things here and there, that's where I'll do like level design and make new areas and, you know, bring new assets into the game, things like that that I don't have to kind of get too in-depth, spend like a lot of time at one time. And you, you mentioned that you... Uh, you, you you did some testing uh, and 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 you got some good feedback from that in terms of the uh, motion and stuff. So how how do you go about doing the testing? Do you get uh, like who's testing your game? Because none of us can test it right now. Uh, but, is it mostly close people like family and friends, or do you actually uh, build a community? How do you go about the testing part to get that feedback from people? So um, a lot of it was sending it to like YouTubers, people that want to do videos on it, and they would kind of send me feedback, and then. Actually, the very first uh, early prototype, the one that has that weird grid movement and like a kind of randomized battle, that one I did actually put up. It's on itch.io and Viveport. 
So I did get feedback from that. People are like, oh, you know, I like the combat and it's fun, but this weird grid system is annoying and right. I don't like teleporting. And then, uh, right. so yeah, I was able to get some feedback from that and uh, got it. Well, why didn't they like the teleporting part? Uh, I think people in general just don't like teleporting in VR. Like, a lot of people just like want smooth ocean all the time. But okay. I think they didn't like to just being uh, locked into a certain area because mm -hmm. the idea was the of the game that kind of inspired the loop was. Um, when you're in Pokemon and you have to go from one city to the next, and as you're kind of walking, you get stopped with random battles from the grass. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how this was. Like you teleported to the next tile and it triggered a random battle. Right. And you had kind of a limited area you could move around in. And uh, yeah, people tolerated that. But uh, I think they kind of, when they're in VR, they just kind of want the, the freedom to just move around and do whatever they want. So that's, you know, kind of what I built the second iteration off of. And uh, do do you, uh, are you planning to build? Uh, at what stage do you start to plan to build a community so uh, so that you so that you 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 know you have that rapport with potential users and early adopters? So right now, um, well, I do have my Discord community, and occasionally on there, I'll go out there for testers. But that's usually like um, I'm too lazy or too tired to like test something. So I'll just be like, hey, who's who's ready? And I'll send them something like, tell me if this works. But uh, yeah, I'm actually starting soon on 9.15. I'm going to start uh, like a Patreon where mm -hmm. people can go ahead and uh, join that to download like the in-progress game. And then people will be able to give feedback. And I'm also planning on having voting so people will be able to vote, you know, which weapons do you want added next or what enemies, things you want added next into the game. Uh, that way, you know, the community can kind of give their feedback, let me know, you know what they want to enjoy in it. So how do you go about building that community? Is it mostly uh, word of mouth or their... Uh, so you post things like in Reddit and all that kind of stuff, or how, how yeah. do you go about it? So the two big ones that I use is um, Reddit and Twitter. Um, TikTok's uh, heard is a great one. I, I just barely start on that, so I don't have too much advice there. But I know Twitter and Reddit are the two good ones. Um, with Twitter, I would say, you know, when people first started on that, don't get discouraged because you're going to have like a small audience. But that you kind of build up, you snowball. Um, you know, as some person, they see something they like it, they share it. You'll kind of build up a following. So Twitter, it won't you won't get that big like massive hit right away, but that'll kind of snowball. So that's a good one to be on, and that's also great for networking with other uh, you know developers, uh, content creators, things like that. Uh, Reddit is a good one. You won't really get you know followers on that, but because it is not you know follower based, you can just with no previous you know following pop on there, and if you have something good, you can drop it and get maybe you know a couple hundred up to a thousand views. And uh, from there, you can build your community. You can um, put in a comment underneath your main post, you know, links to your Steam page so they can wishlist it or your Discord if you're collecting people there or however you're, you know, kind of wanting to build your community. So in terms of when you're developing uh, your, your VR application now, there's a lot of art that goes into it, not just the programming part. Now, I understand clearly that you have programming skills, without a doubt. We know you're the guy behind it. Um, but when it comes to the art, did you develop the art? Did you uh, collaborate with other people? Because a lot of work goes into making things look that good, to be honest, right? Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, I don't have anyone else working on it, but it's not, I can't say it's 100% me because a lot of the things, um, the way I do it is I'll buy characters off the asset store that look, okay. you know, wow. somewhat, yeah, somewhat similar along the lines of what I want. And mm -hmm. then I'll kind of bring them in and I'll edit their materials, their textures. Uh, maybe change up their accessories a little bit and just kind of mm -hmm. get them to fit in the game. And um, yeah, that is a great way to, you know, save time and money because, you know, you, getting custom models is insanely expensive, but you can go, right. um, you know, the Unity Asset Store or Sketchfab or there's a few other websites you can go out there and you could buy really good 3D models. And um, it, honestly, if you modify the textures, you know, if you have a kind of a set style for your game and you make all the assets fit that style, uh, not very many people are going to know that those, you know, came from all different places. It's going to look like it fits in the game if you if you just do that little bit extra to make it fit in. Right. And um, did you have to use other 3D software as in order to change some of the aspects to the characters or or, or prefabs? No, I didn't. Um, it probably, you know, if someone does have those skills, they would definitely be really useful. That's just um, one one avenue that I personally didn't develop. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'll go ahead. Uh, I actually have a few programs for editing things inside Unity because I'm 
resistant to learning new programs. But yeah, I have I can one. Understand, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I have one called Umotion <laughs> for kind of editing and modifying animations. So I try to buy the animations already made, but I'll do little tweaks on it. And um, same thing with the modeler. I have one called Umodeler where if I want to, um, you know, just make the character's head bigger or something, you know, small like that, I'll go ahead and do it myself. Uh, but I, you know, being a, when you're a solo developer, you're kind of a jack of all trades and you can't right. really sometimes pick and choose which ones, which things you focus on more and which things you kind of just throw money at. And for right. me, models is one of those things that I just kind of buy. <laughs> from the, well, I, that's what I was going to ask you because uh, animation can be tricky if the character doesn't move the way you want or don't do the action that you want, but you like the look of the, of the model is how you were able to, uh, to work on that without having too much of a headache, especially if you're not using, uh, if you're not working with someone else to do it for you. Uh, and it's something that you have to do uh, on the flyer, uh, I, I guess. Yeah, what's nice about Unity is uses something called Mechanim and Humanoid um, Rigs. So there are some, you know, weird characters where they're like a crab and, you know, that, those animations are only going to work for that character. But for the most part, if it's like a general human shaped character, their animations are kind of interchangeable. Right. So over time, you know, when there's sales or I see like good ones, I'll kind of just buy animation packs and mm -hmm. I kind of have like a big collection built up. So when I'm ready to add a new character, I can kind of browse through different animations and kind of pull some in. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, I have this other program called Umotion where it actually lets you kind of uh, like modify and animations that already exist, but in layers. So right. if for some reason, the character's arm is just too far this way. You can move it a little bit and that change will actually carry out through the rest of the animation so you can make little tweaks like that on the fly but yeah it's kind of definitely having a good library already built up is a good thing and having those little bit of skills that just make those little changes where you need to helps out a lot right so how how long have you been working on uh, on this vr application so this particular game so that first initial prototype i started in september of last year and um you know and i was kind of learning as i was going on along and seeing what works Mm -hmm. And then uh, I worked on until that version up until about the end of February. So, so that was version one. Yeah, that was version one with like the grid. And then if you've seen clips of it, it has like really like low poly um, like animations or characters. And then, um, yeah, the new version I just started working on in uh, March of this year. And so everything you've seen like video clips on, that's just from March until now. Right. And uh, when when did you come up with the name and how did you come up with the name? Uh. Well, when I knew it was going to be a samurai game, I started, you know, samurai. And then um, I like anything that has like assonance where it's like the same letters. So I was thinking like, oh, samurai slide, samurai shogun, samurai showdown is already taken down. So mm -hmm. then I thought, um, I don't know what kind of, oh, you know what? I was watching <laughs> an old sci-fi movie and um, this alien was yelling at this guy and he was like, I welcomed you to our planet. And you turned it into a slaughterhouse. And then I was just thinking about that movie when I was coming up with names. And that's where that word slaughterhouse came from. So I just threw it on there. Samurai slaughterhouse. But it sounds good. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Sci-fi movie that inspired you to <laughs> have the name Samurai Slaughterhouse. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty awesome. So how, how far are you? um now and I, I know you say you want to release it in 2022 when when do you want to release it when do you think because sometimes sometimes an artist can feel like nothing is ever finished but uh when do you feel you know you'll be ready to release something to the audience so hopefully for next month it'll be pretty much ready at least for the first initial like early access preview so um as far as it being like a complete just like a mini experience it's almost done the only little major things left is the options menu. So that's what I'm working on this week. Um, and that'll maybe kind of extend for another week or so. But after that, it has kind of like the pretty much everything is going to be in the game. And from there, it's just going to be adding content and expanding the story. And um, I'm not really sure how long that's going to take because I've never made a, kind of like an extensive story. I, mean, I guess I've done a little bit in RPG Maker. but. Uh, well, yeah. by the way, what, what is the story of Samurai Slaughter House? So the story that it's going to be right now is you're essentially... Um, there's a, a, a warlord, like a demon king, that's kind of taking over the whole land. And he's working his way, uh, like, west towards the sea. And the clan that you're in, they're not in it curling his path, but they just know as soon as that warlord, he once he hits the sea, he's going to turn his attention towards them. So what you're doing in the game is in preparation for that, you're going to all the other, like, lands that he hasn't conquered. 
and you're kind of doing them favors and making allies and joining alliances with them. And the idea is as you're going along, you kind of make friends with these people that can actually fight alongside you. They could be allies with you in the game. And then it eventually works up to a final battle against like this, uh, you know, the demon warlord. And you'll have all your allies that you made throughout the game come with you for like a kind of big climactic battle. So it'll all be revolving around that. You kind of go to a town, you do some quests, make some allies, you know, beat some boss or whatever. And then it kind of unlocks the next town that you can go to kind of be that kind of gameplay loop. So when, when you're saying, when you're talking about uh, making allies with various different people, it sounds to me like uh, Samurai Slaughterhouse would eventually become multiplayer or would it already be in multiplayer mode? So, yeah, when, it's, uh, when I say other people, I mean like NPCs. <laughs> of course. So it, yeah, of yeah, course. it'll be different like characters they join you. So um, I don't know about multiplayer. I'm going to see what people want. Um, I was hired to adapt kind of the game into like a multiplayer tech demo for like some other hardware. So mm -hmm. um, I may end up making a multiplayer. It just depends what people want. It may be PvP or it may just be uh, kind of like an arena thing where the two of you spawn in clear out a bunch of enemies so it would just depends what people want but at least for right now the focus is single player and how tough was it to develop the story and how do you manage to to narrow that i mean how do you go about developing the story for the game so um i kind of just take inspiration from a lot of different things mainly uh like a little bit of historical like this was kind of what was going on during the sengoku period in japan mm -hmm. um, right. there was like warlords trying to kind of take over the country in united so it was inspired by that and then aside from that, it's just like a lot of anime trope. I just watched all kinds of animes to try to get ideas. And I figure if you take ideas from enough different places, it's not going to look like you stole it just from one. But uh, yeah, this is, that's what kind of the story ideas. Are. So in terms of the uh, early access, so the version that will be available to people will be a early access. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. I mean, early <laughs> access, kind of like the basic features of the game. Okay, so in the basic features, what are we to expect? Is there one map, uh, a bit like uh, Assassin's Creed, where you have just one gigantic map and you get to travel in different worlds and different uh, different section of sorry, is one world or two world? I, I think it's one world. Um, and then as you travel, the you know the desert changes to forest and the forest changes to snow. Uh, what 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 kind of maps or how how does the how does the gameplay go about? So it is kind of free forming, but just. Um I guess for like performance issues kind of broken up so you'll be you kind of start off in a village and there's like a you know a big mountains area area and a few different areas you can explore there and then you get to another point and um, you can kind of tell it kind of goes off into a canyon once you get in there then it kind of loads into the next area but yeah you are able to just kind of freely explore um in the first uh, demo there's gonna be four zones the first zone is kind of uh your village and also like the there's a big castle uh that I, I kind of closed it off because it's empty inside, but eventually you'll be able to explore in there. And uh, then you go and there's like kind of these cliff areas. There's a bunch of big cliffs and like rickety wooden bridges all connecting them. And when you kill the guys, you can like knock them over the edges. And then um, I got a little like bamboo forest area with a hut. And then there's another area that's like a swamp area where you're kind of like waist deep in like murky black water. And there's these like, uh, like frog looking like monsters coming after you. Right. And how, how was um, how do you manage to put scale together? Because you could have decided to have you know these maps be spread over tens of hundreds of miles apart. Uh, how do you decide on on the scale of of these different environments? So it was mainly because uh, I kind of look at it. I'm like mainly an artist, like besides game programming. So I look at it from an artistic point, and I kind of okay. have a vision. You know, what what do we want to show? What kind of angles do we want to see what kind of right. nice views when they go up to these cliff sides mm -hmm. and i kind of make the size based off that and um, try not to make it too much bigger than necessary just to kind of keep everything looking nice and performing well on like computers but uh yeah it's kind of like as, as, as big as is needed to get get the effect that we're going for right did you have to change i mean did you trial different scales or uh w was the first time round you kind of knew already what it was going to look like in vr so the different map areas i made them separately the kind of the smaller one is that's like a little bamboo forest with a little mm -hmm. house in the middle and um i kind of made that one smaller mainly because it was the first like kind of test area and i just didn't want to have too crazy of an area and i wasn't sure how it would do the performance wise so then when i went to the next one i blew it up like 10 times as big and uh that was as big as i needed it and it still performed well so i just rolled with that size for those uh 
It was mad. Right. And so you developed for the Quest first, and then you developed for Steam after, right? So, um, I mean, you used you use the tool that enables you to uh, tra transpose everything. But um, what are some of the things that, you know, you added in the PC VR version? Um, and did it did it make you feel, oh, no, I can't put this in the Quest or, or both? Or, or yeah, same? it was actually the other way around. So I started making oh. it for the PC VR. Oh, okay, and then, right. Uh, and then, yeah, when I switched it over to the Quest, there was a... Uh, Quite a few things that uh, didn't didn't carry over well. So the real time shadows, they you know I don't know if you've seen Quest games, but that just those had to go out the window. But luckily, oh, okay. the material could kind of calculate its own fake shadows, so it kind of has a more comic booky look. And then um, also the kind of Udini terrain, those had to be turned into meshes, so it lost some of the, kind of the, some of the nice like gradients in it. Right. Uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely going from the Quest, there were uh, quite a few things that get cut out. But uh, a lot of things didn't like, uh, for instance, like the trees, those switch to, you know, what are called billboards, where mm -hmm. it's just like it sounds like it's like a flat picture instead of an actual 3D right. model. Right. But right. what's kind of nice is that because the game is stylized and everything is supposed to look flat anyways, you kind of don't notice it as much when that turns into a billboard from far away. So luckily that if those things combined with a few other things got it still looking pretty good on the quest, I think. And um, how do you deal with uh, one of the things that I, that bothers me on the quest a lot? I guess I mean it's not just the quest; it's in general. Uh, it would have to be things like jagged edges. Is this something you had to to that was challenging on uh, using the quest, or when you went over, all the edges look pretty much smooth from the get go? Yeah, at least the um, the edges. Yeah, in general, the edges look pretty good. The only edges that kind of look a little funny is like the shadows they're a little pixelated right, right. but um but yeah it couldn't be avoided but i think for the most part you're you're moving around the action is going fast enough that you don't really notice it too much so the gameplay between both is pretty much uh the same right so there's no change to story or you know all, all those kind of things it's basically the the same yeah the same, the same experience, experience right? it's just kind of graphically a little bit different yeah exactly but i didn't want to make sure that the the quest version they get like the same the same story it's not like a a dumbed down version right and uh, when you were working on the bigger landscapes uh was it challenging to you know render the various because it sounds like in the bamboo world you have a i mean bamboo forest that's a lot of yeah uh, prefabs right so how do you manage to to handle all that so that there's no lagging or you know all those kind of things so i actually used um a unity asset let me look at the name of it <laughs> real quick but yeah there's there's a couple different ones because at first it was not uh it was not friendly even on the pc it was just killing it having all those tons of like little bamboo trees everywhere but we ended up i tried a couple different ones there's a nature render that one worked really well but i just upgraded recently one called a uh, mega world is what it's called right and it um it not only handles the um and i haven't got into this yet but it can actually procedurally generate it where it'll add in trees and bushes based on elevation like where those will naturally be and it handles, I don't know, understand the magic behind it, but it will uh, somehow render tons of trees and it just it doesn't, it doesn't grade without using a lot of processing power. And, wow. uh, and it is a dynamic level of detail. So if someone's mm -hmm. computer is weaker or someone's on the Quest 1 instead of the Quest 2, based on the performance, it will, you know, cut out some trees or turn more trees into billboards, whatever it needs to do to make up for it. So you really feel like Unity was a go-to tool that's really... Uh, manage to help you to, I mean, it can really handle this this game that you're trying to develop pretty well. It sounds. Yeah, it, it has a lot of cool things. Um, with Unreal, I haven't gotten too much into Unreal, but you know, I have a lot of friends that are developing into it. And yeah, I was going to ask you why <laughs> why did you go into Unity as your first choice and not uh, not Unreal? Uh, in so, fact, so the the plus side to Unreal is there are a lot of things that you that it comes with for free that it just does out of the box. And you can do those in Unity, but you maybe have to spend like $80, like $100 on a tool to do it. So that's the downside to Unity. But the upside to Unity is that there are so many more tutorials and resources and things to learn. Um, so if I have a question like, oh, why is it this joint doing this weird physics thing? There's probably something I can find on, um, you know, online that'll right. tell me exactly what that problem is. Whereas Unreal, it's a little bit harder to find things like that. And a lot of times when you do, 
Um, some people program in C, C++ in C++, Unreal, yeah. and some people use the, the their blueprints thing, which is like a visual code. Mm -hmm. And when people post that on message boards and stuff, they literally just post a screenshot of all these little nodes connecting everywhere, right. and it's like, how, <laughs> how are we going to read that? So that that was why I like Unity. It, uh, there's just a lot more resources, a lot more tools, and then also the asset store is a lot nicer because I know when I was talking to like my Unreal people and they're like, oh, I can't figure out how to do this. I'm like, oh, just just right. go on the asset store and find you know spend 10, 15 bucks and get a tool to do that. And they're like, I already looked, there's nothing there. And I'm like, oh, that's, <laughs> on the Unity asset store, there's like five different tools that do that, and you just gotta pick the best one. So I think it's, it it kind of makes it easier, especially if you're working on your own, you don't have like a lot of those advanced like technical skills. You can find things on the Unity asset store that'll kind of fill in fill in those gaps for you. So you, you mentioned that you're an artist. That's good to know. That's pretty cool. Um, do you have sketches or stuff you painted, you know, uh, as you're developing, um, you know, Samurai Slaughterhouse or was everything just kept in your head and then you put it yeah, on the PC? Yeah, there are actually a few things. Well, I mean, they were digitally painted, but actually the skyboxes, mm -hmm. um, the way those were made, I took um, a little bit. I went on public domain, like uh, museum websites, and I found like really old paintings from the 1700s. And I took little details like the houses and the trees from them. But as far as like the mountains themselves, I actually digitally painted those. So I used the Corel Painter where it kind of simulates like water paint brushes. So I was able to paint the mountains and everything. Um, so that, that's how those came up. Um, those were hand painted. And then a few of the textures and the characters I did by hand as well. So, but. so what, what are your expectations uh, when you release Samurai? Uh, slaughterhouse and also where where do you want this thing to go like what 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 do you want out of this uh, vr experience once it's released onto the world so um well my biggest Unleashed. hope is just that that people will people will enjoy it of course that people will like it and that the people who uh who would like it will hear about it i just don't want anyone that would be a fan of it to not hear about the game uh, as far as uh, monetary like my own hopes for it is uh i really just want enough to to find the next VR game because right now uh, I'm doing this without any funding, which means I'm working my full time job. I work that and I get off and I work on this and it's pretty tiring. So if I just had enough just to fund the next game, like I would be happy. Um, and I'm as far as how uh, how far I take it, I'll just see, you know, how how long interest keeps up in it, how long I keep making money on it. Um, I'm, you know, once I'm starting the Patreon, I'll see, you know, if people you know like it and back it and want it to keep, you know, evolving to something larger, I'll kind of. Um, you know, take it as far as the people want, I guess, like as far as, you know, as long as I have the support for it. Right. And will it, once it's released, uh, do you think it's a good, a good thing to just stop working on it for a little while to get the feedback to see how you would then develop it? Or do, is it better to just keep developing and, and keep releasing new updates? What, what's your take on that? I, I'm probably just going to keep like going at it and developing it because there's always just more things to do on it. So I'm sure when it's first released, especially, you know, e even without having to wait a long time, like people are going to find those bugs <laughs> within the first, you know, little bit of time. So I'll probably, uh, yeah, just probably just continuously develop on it until it's in a good place or, you know, people are over it and then we can move on to the next game. So you, you feel you basically, so you feel that you've, developed enough maps or enough environments, enough levels. I, I don't know what's the technical jargon. Uh, I guess there's many different ways to say it. Um, and then you you focus more on the actual gameplay side of it. So for example, how you buy new store, uh, new items in the store or how you navigate through the game. What, what are some of the things that you feel uh, would need more work on? So yeah, right now I want to have all the all the systems in place, and that's kind of more important than the content because I have enough areas to at least demonstrate all the game's features. Like I have a couple NPCs, I'll get some more filled in there. But I have like a village and like a couple other you know, areas you can go to with houses. Um, so yeah, right now a few things left on my list is going to be uh, a lot of the game's progress is going to be revolving around collecting resources. So right now, when you kill an enemy, it actually gives you resources. There's just no menu in the game and no pop up to tell you that you're collecting it. So that's kind of where the next thing on the list is. And you kill an enemy, it kind of pops up and say, hey, you got, you know, frog legs or like plant leaves or whatever from this enemy. And right. then you'll use that to, uh, you know, complete quest. You know, people will say, oh, I need so many of this item. Or uh, it may be used for like crafting, making like potions, items that you can use, things like that. So that's kind of the, 
where the next focus is. So uh, in your game, when you're in between screens and uh, or you're talking to, because you can talk to a character, is that right? Yeah, you can talk to NPCs in it. Um, there was... So how, how do you interact? Is it purely text? Is it voice? Have you thought about, I mean, how, how do you decide uh, which which way to to have the communication that you feel uh, suits your your style of gameplay? So it does. It has a little bit of both as text and voice acting, but the text, um, and you kind of see this in a lot of games where the text will be kind of a real detailed, kind right. of like a paragraph, and then the voice acting is like, "Oh, hi there. Oh, what do you think? Or how are you doing?" So to have like kind of that simple little single phrase voice acting, kind of going together with um, like the kind of more longer text where they're kind of more detailed talking about things and that's just so that i can you know add more quests add content and quickly without having to to call my voice actors every time i want to add something new into the game um instead i have kind of like a, a good array of like gener generic phrases from them that they can kind of say as the dialogue's popping up and then it has a i may update the ui on this for right now it's kind of a dialogue wheel that pops up that the player has like different responses they can pick from and so they're able to aim and pick the one they So want. for the for the voices, did you learn a did you use a, a a software or did you get people on board? How do you get the voices? Yeah, so that I use actual voice actors. That's the one thing that I do do like a normal game game developer uh, and voice actors. There's a lot of amateur voice actors who are excited and they're they're willing to do it for free, but I still pay them like something because I feel bad. But uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to find voice actors. You just put out a picture of the character and say, "Hey, I'm looking for someone to voice this." and you have a whole giant inbox full of people wanting to voice that character. So, uh, wow. yeah, it's not too hard to, to find voice actors, especially if you're and making that, something cool that people want to be involved with. Well, what is the interaction like when you're, you know, working uh, with people who are volunteering? So, I mean, I, I do feel bad, or I did feel bad, like, about asking for re records, but that's actually, like, 100% completely a normal thing. Like, the voice actors are expecting to get that back. So if you are working with them, don't feel bad if you have to say, you know, oh, you know, I like these lines, but hey, this is a little too cheesy or, you know, the character is supposed to be a little darker than this. So, yeah, that's a completely a normal thing. And um, like I said, a lot of these voice actors, they are willing to do it for free. So sending them, you know, 20, 30 bucks, like they're they're happy. They're like, oh, you're actually going to pay me. That's great. So, um, yeah, yeah, they, they don't mind doing re-records. And then uh, also it'll happen a lot where, you know, these are the lines I think I'm going to need. But then as I start putting them into the game, I'm like, hey, I don't have any lines of the character when they, you know, kill an enemy. So we need a bunch of you know lines for that. So, yeah, it's not a big deal going back and forth asking for changes and things like that. Does performance, th does the PC that you use uh, play a big part in the performance or the final output uh, of the product that you're trying to, to develop? Um, I, so I have a uh, RTX 2070, so it's not like the greatest GPU ever, but it's fairly high up there. Um, I would say hopefully not because, you know, you want it to work on low end systems and I have sent it over to people on discord, lower end system. They said it works great. Um, but even if it's not affecting, you know, the quality of the final product, it definitely helps having a higher end video card during development because, um, however fast the game is going to run normally, it runs maybe like 60 percent as fast in the editor mm -hmm. so um, yeah it helps to have like that little bit beefier of the computer and also when you're doing things like baking light or compiling um it, your computer sitting for like an hour as opposed to your computer only having to sit for like 20 minutes that makes nice. like you know a big difference on things and uh, but unity uh compared to other programs you feel uh, runs. I mean, I, I also use a, a twenty seventy. Although I don't know if just a, what what about the CPU that you're using? What kind of CPU do you use? I have a ninety seven hundred right now, and um, it's great for most things. If I'm being honest, it, it, there are a few times when it hits a hundred percent usage, so I wouldn't mind something a little bit beefier. But it gets me by pretty good. <laughs> and uh, did you uh, did you use other systems? Uh, maybe because you were traveling or you had to use different systems for different things. Uh, if so, were you able to compare those uh, performances or, or you just used your own system? Yeah, I, may, I mostly just used my own system, but I did have um, like a 9600 before and, oh no, 9400. 9, and when I bumped up to the 9700, that did make like a pretty big difference. So you could oh. tell the extra cores and stuff. Cool. And did you, by the way, uh, have the opportunity to work 
in house for another game development uh, company as well. What 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 kind of did did you? I mean, yeah, did you? <laughs> no, no, all my uh, my you know professional regular jobs are just boring stuff. Like uh, I was a substitute teacher before. I did a. Uh, right now, I'm working like insurance. That's my day job that I'm trying to, to quit. But uh, yeah, I don't have any uh, normal professional experience. But I have been. Uh, since I started making this game, I actually got contracted by a, another company to make like a tech demo for their VR hardware, and uh, I got so I got little side jobs here and there, but not no actual full time work for it, the game development. Right, and how how come? Uh, I mean, maybe you can talk to us. Maybe it's a geographical thing, or uh, because you know a lot of people feel that once they graduate or what have you not, you know, once they have the skills they feel uh, they need, it'll be very easy to, uh, you know, get into the 3D development uh, industry. Do you think that that's true? Uh, you know, what what made you perhaps not go into that career uh, full time, either freelance or, you know, work, working for a company? Um, I think it's just uh, fear of <laughs> going out and kind of putting out and trying to do something creative. I had I've worked right. like the job I've had now. I've worked at for ten years, and I, you know, I kind of fell into it sort of, but I ended up moving up in the company. So you kind of get comfortable, and uh, yeah, I just kind of n never went for it. So I, don't, I can't really say too much. But from reading people's experiences that they are working in the industry, I think I am happier uh, doing it on my own <laughs> than working right. for like a big company. From what I hear a lot of people saying, do do you think that if you were doing it full time, it would take away the magic for you, like? You know, the fact that you're doing it uh, on the side makes you feel like it's more exciting? Uh, no, I think it went, once I do, if I am able to get enough from the Patreon or make enough from Quinn and do it full time, I think I will definitely enjoy it. I, you know, I've taken days off of my day job and just been able to work at game development all day. And uh, yeah, and I love it. I mean, I get burned out a little sooner. Normally on days where I'm just doing game development, I'll get burned out maybe around seven. And or if I'm doing it just like after my day job, I'll go all the way until you know, about 10 when I'm ready to go to bed. So. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think I'll enjoy it. <laughs> but at the same time, you're, you're working on a project that is kind of your baby, right? What if you were developing a game that's about, uh, I don't know, like uh, it was for, that was for kids, oh, teenagers, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, you, you're like uh, looking after a dog and, um, and you have to feed it like a tamagoshi, you know? I mean, what, what, what if you're working on those kind of projects? Would, would, would that suck your creative energy it out of you? I think I think maybe the project type I would be okay with, but yeah, definitely doing something where it's like you have to do it for someone else. Because even like I said, when I adapted my own game into like a multiplayer tech demo, like mm -hmm. uh, every time I would get something like Slack is the communication program we use, like to communicate with these people. And every time I hear like the the Slack noise pop up, I'm like, oh man, what do they want now? Like, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I have to go back and work on this tech demo. Like, I want to, you know, I want to add new characters to my game. I don't want to work on synchronizing things and stuff. so yeah I, I think definitely when you're doing something you know for someone else's project it does kind of take a little bit of the fun out of it <laughs> and by the way when you when you play vr experiences or just normal computer game experiences uh because you kind of know the you know the, the behind the scenes of the magic tricks uh does it take away your uh your 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 enjoyment or do you i mean do you, like you put the headset on you're playing a game and you go oh okay so um you know they use this uh spawn system or <laughs> oh there's there must be an if and else uh method here and you know oh okay i mean do, do you think of these things or you just get to enjoy the game i think it's usually the other way around sometimes i do think about those things and i'm it's usually the other way it's like oh wow i'm impressed like how did they do that like oh wow they must have done all these things to uh you know come up with that and uh the only time sometimes when i and, you know this is ironic because i was the one saying like it's okay to buy unity asset stores but there are a few certain assets i don't want to name any names but that are very inexpensive and very overused <laughs> and sometimes when i see that i'm like oh come on like you, this is a really good game just replace this with a five dollar model that's not like everywhere like <laughs> but uh yeah, yeah, I think for the most part, it, if anything, it, it heightens my appreciation of it because I can appreciate you know, how, how hard it is to do certain things. So, so I have a few questions to ask you. Uh, the first thing would be, what are the kind of resources that you feel, uh, you know, would have really helped you to build this game faster? Or, you know, what, what are some of the things that you wish uh, you could have had 
to have a better experience or to have a faster experience, whatever kind of more positive experience? So probably some of my tips would be um, when you when you are going to first start out, do look at your first draft as like your prototype. Uh, when I was working on my prototype, I mentioned it had that grid system and it was very time consuming to put those grids on there. And, you know, I would spend like an hour an evening like putting put it you know i'll be watching tv shows while i'm doing it but just like copying and pasting these grids everywhere and setting up all these encounters that was like a lot of time wasted that i could have spent doing something else and um, i don't consider the time that i worked on the prototype wasted because you know i needed to experiment and learn those new things and what worked and what didn't but uh yeah just fleshing out like so much of the levels and making these big giant areas was unnecessary so i would say uh, you know, don't get too crazy with your first draft is one of my big tips. And then, um, you know, don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money too, like especially on like tools, they'll make your life easier. And um, if you kind of look at it, even if you're just, you know, if you're looking at it as an investment, you can look at it that way. But even if you're looking at it as a hobby, like if you think about how much you spend on, you know, video games or, you know, your computer or, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, and just look at it like a hobby and say, you know, okay, you know, I don't mind spending, you know, $50 here, $20 on my hobby. So, uh, yeah, don't be, a, don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money. Even if you don't, you know, end up releasing your game, making that money back, you'll still have fun making the game. So, still worth it. <laughs> cool. And what about uh, in terms of the engine and also the code you're using in order to get the best security features as possible uh, for your game so people can't change the score or, I don't know, just get more item you know get more items and they're not supposed to be uh, getting how how do you how do you uh, put that together when you're developing your 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 game so that's handled mostly by like the the save system and um if you are writing it yourself from scratch then it probably and you know, that's probably what you're going to do for your first prototype is write it from scratch it will just be like a a text document with a bunch of numbers that anyone can go in and like edit which uh, you may want to do yourself, you know, when you're testing. But yeah, once you are later down the line, um, and that's, like I said, another time, something you can hit the Unity Asset Store for. But most safe systems, uh, they will have something that will actually encrypt it for you. And there are actually uh, three ones. There's one that I use called uh, Easy Save. Um, and I have I use kind of two save systems together, one for saving uh, like data and the other one for saving like the positions of things. But that's actually something that built into the asset it'll have like encryption where it'll you know scramble all that and then descramble it itself so that that's something that you know you can just throw money at it and it'll do it for you um now you're planning to put this on uh the app lab or site quest is that right yeah so for the quest version i'm not 100 percent sure where it's going to go if it is you know just me on my own it probably is going to have to go through uh, app lab first and side quest before it can get on the official store um I have been talking to a few different publishers and they're mostly interested in taking over like the quest release and possibly like PSVR two. Um, if they can get that going, we're still waiting to hear back from Sony, but yeah, so if the publisher takes it over, they probably have a little more pool. So maybe it'll hit the official store fingers crossed like at launch, but that's you know still kind of up in the air at this point. Do, do you think it would be ready or do you would need more time? Because, uh, you it's, I mean, yeah. When do you think you would be you would be ready personally feel comfortable uh, to have your app running on those kind of big bigger platforms? So this probably would be towards the end of next year, um, which when I do the early access too that I'm doing soon, that won't be on Steam because you know even if it says early access when people see something on Steam, they expect it to be pretty much ready to go. But yeah, right now the goal is uh, end of 2022. Is when I want to do like the real the official main release. Uh, you know, here's the game, and hopefully at that point the story will be complete. But if the story is not 100% complete, um, as long as all the features are there, it's bug free, and there's a good chunk of the story, I'll be happy. Because uh, I think it is kind of cool when games release periodic yeah. updates and add more story content. Definitely, yeah, for sure. So I think at that time it'll be solid. So even if it's not 100% complete, it'll be complete where people it'll be like will part be happy one. With the product. <laughs> yeah. yeah part one and then you wait for part two right yeah wait for the next episode to come out and keep it you know keep the excitement rolling i wanted to ask you about monetization very quickly um now obviously you know you guys all do the things that you do for fun passion 
but obviously you wish for it to expand and have a life of its own so that eventually you can you know go to the second phases of of your lives or of the of the game um when do you start to think about monetization do you think about it at the very beginning before you even start coding uh does it play a very important role talk to me a little bit more about your thought process about this so for me personally since i am kind of like a jack of all trades person that i can uh you know do most of the stuff on my own the funding isn't as important at the beginning um because funding I, or monetization oh well, fun yes, yes. funding is going out to get the money but uh monetization is uh trying to find a way to generate right, so. revenue yeah yeah so um i guess a little bit of both but i mean I, even at the beginning i was thinking about monetization because um you know you do want money to 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 make like the next game uh but yeah, if if yeah, in the in the beginning, it's probably not as important, especially if you are not sure the scale of the game. Because like I said, when I first started it, it was gonna be uh, like Time Crisis. It was gonna be just a quick arcade slasher that you could finish maybe in like two three hours. Um, you know, repeating it with different weapons, things like that. So that was I was probably pricing it, you know, fifteen to twenty. And now I'm kind of wanting to do more of expansive, like kind of a light RPG action adventure type thing. So now I'm looking more about like a $30 price range. Uh, so I think that's something that even if you think about it in the beginning, it's probably going to change as the course you know, goes on. So how, how do you decide about, okay, I'm going to charge someone to uh, download the app versus uh, making it a free a freemium, I would call it, uh, which would be all free play. Um, so you can download it for free, but then in game, uh, you would then charge people for various different things, whether it's weapons or coins or whatever it might be. I think it, a lot of it, at least for me, when I'm doing, because I do have some ideas in mind for games like that. It mm -hmm. kind of just depends on the content of the game, because this one is story based. It's kind of more, you know, get from point A to point B. This one I am planning um, to just do like a traditional, you know, release it. You buy the game, you get through it, and then maybe there'll be DLC or something. Uh, but yeah, I think. Uh, if you do have a game that can be more played infinitely, like kind of a roguelike I was mentioning, I was thinking about that, having like a free version. And mm -hmm. then when you pay to upgrade it, you can get like better weapons drop or maybe there's more maze pieces. So I think if you have a game that can be played infinitely, can be played over and over, um, you know, then that is a kind of a great way to place the release of free game and then uh, just let people pay to enhance their experience. And how, how does coding play a part in terms of uh, deciding on the, um, you know, on, 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 on charging people for stuff, because would it also be more complicated in development to have to, you know, uh, charge people and then you have to code it and, you know, it can create more bugs and all that kind of stuff. Does that play a part in the decision factor as well? Yeah, that could definitely make things more complicated. Obviously, if you're just very first starting out, that can get really confusing. Um, but if you do have a little bit of experience, it shouldn't be too bad. There are things, again, you can hit the Unity Asset Store and buy things, and they'll take care of most of that. Um, and then there are a few other, uh, like, subscription programs you can pay to, because that's the thing, is that on top of uh, uh, not only just programming and putting it in there, you're going to have to pay to be able to accept credit cards from people, to accept payments. You're going to have to pay for servers to store this online data so you can know you know, who bought the DLC, who didn't. Right. So it's kind of, uh, even just programming aside, there are a lot of extra expenses involved. So that is something where you uh, probably want to have a little bit of money ready to go if you're going to start up that, like that. I was going to ask you in terms of servers, uh, are you, did you have to take out a server to host it somewhere or, uh, or, or not really? You can just use local stuff. Yeah, so for... Um, so for the, the game, because it's single player, that's just all, everything's local, so no special hosting there. Right. But when I did do the uh, the tech demo, they uh, that one, there's a lot of different services out there, but basically for those, when you want to do a small multiplayer game, because these, uh, I use one called Normcore, but mm -hmm. there's another one you probably have called Proton. And when you set those up, it's free, and you can have up to maybe like 10 or 15 people on it. And then if you want more than so many people, then you have to pay for it. And uh, that's a good way. It kind of benefits both because uh, it benefits you as a developer. You can start for free. And then um, I guess it kind of benefits them because it's already so far integrated into your game. You don't have any choice but to pay them to keep it going. Right. Once you game. But, you know, if your game does, I think it's you have up to 100 users, actually. If your game does have more than 100 concurrent users, you're probably 
not hurting I mean, money. It, so. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it depends on the, yeah, on, and the services. And I guess this would add on to the expense sheet. So then it would, you know, impact in a way the pricing of the game. Because I was going to ask you, how do you decide? You say, you mentioned that you might um, sell your, your game for $30.00. Uh, US dollars, I imagine that, would, yeah. yeah, of course, that's US dollars. Uh, you know, how, how do you decide on that number? So essentially, I'm, uh, I, I kind of looked at other games that offered like similar things and kind of price it based off that. Um, a lot of it's just kind of thinking, you know, what are people willing to pay for this? And, um, you know, and I, I think the quality of the game that I'm offering is have a story, it's expansive, it's a little bit more than most VR games. So right. I can get away with charging with 30. Um, maybe even a little more, but it, it all just depends, uh, you know, what, what, what you think people are willing to pay for it and, you know, what you as the creator feel that it's worth. And uh, do you get to talk to other developers as well in your field who have released a game at a certain price and hear about, you know, the challenges they've had or uh, the things they've had to do to, you know, to, to get the price right? Um, I have heard a little bit. Um, it's usually just people complaining, though. You know, we always, everyone likes to complain <laughs> about their own, their own stuff. But um, yeah, from what I understand, like if you if you put your game, if you charge more for your game, more people are actually willing to buy it than if it's cheaper, which surprised me. Um, but that's like a statistic. There may be you know other factors involved. But uh, yeah, I think uh, you know put out what your game is, is you think it's worth and. Uh, maybe even a little bit more because that way you have room to cut it off when you're going on sales because sales is you know the big thing so if you put it already a rock bottom price you're not going to have a lot to cut off when you put it on sale so it's another thing to keep in mind so talking a, a little bit about the pricing in terms of pricing structure for for your game and stuff which i think is very fascinating uh is the marketing part so does charging a little bit higher uh enable you or you're thinking down the line about how you can do promotions uh you know talk to me a little bit more your thinking process about the marketing of your game to to generate as many downloads as you can is that something that you've thought about or not yet or if you have thought about it you know how, how do you put things together so i have put a little bit of thought into it um i'm sure if i end up doing it with a publisher they'll probably end up taking over a lot of the marketing but as far as um from what i've observed and uh you know just looking at the scene kind of the traditional marketing isn't as big for vr it's hard to put out commercials because you don't know who has a VR headset, who doesn't. So kind of a lot of the marketing, the big thing right now is to get all the YouTubers involved. So I've been kind of doing that, you know, making connections with them, um, planning on having like some contests to you, giving out like, you know, sweaters, things like that. Um, some of the tools I'm going to have in the game is actually for creating like clips. I'm going to have like a third person camera. So, you know, while you're playing, instead of it just seeing from the first person, like, you, you know, content creators will be able to create clips of their character from like a third person fighting. And I'm thinking about having clip contests. So a lot of people will be making clips and posting them and getting the word out like that. A lot of, you know, guerrilla marketing, which I think is great for VR because VR is kind of a little bit more of a niche community. And uh, so I, I know you said 2022. Uh, wh when are we looking in? Uh, sorry, can you repeat again? When are you looking in 2022 to release the early access? Uh, so for the early access, like the, the early, early access, that's actually going to be next month, September 15th. Okay, so that'll be September 15th. Okay, got it. Yeah, and that'll just be on the Patreon. And the way I'm thinking to do that is it'll be like $5 a month. But once you, if you do hit 30, like you pay six months in a row, then you'll get a key. So you can, you know, keep playing it if you don't want to continue on the Patreon. Um, but also on the Patreon, I'm going to have like the music that I made for the game and just like uh, other stuff up. So it'll maybe still be worth like, you know, staying joined for people. And then, yeah, towards the end of 2022, I'm thinking maybe October, November is when I want to do the actual release, like on Steam and uh, possibly the Oculus if it's ready for, at that point. You must think that everything's a priority. <laughs> um, so how do you get to, to plan your time and really prioritize what you think is most important? What tips do you have there? So, um, yeah, the biggest thing is kind of looking where your giant chunks of time are. So that's like the weekend. So anything... That's going to be really complicated or just going to you think is going to take a long time and you usually end up doesn't taking as long as you think it will but I'll, I'll put those on the weekend and what's good thing about scheduling things specific things on the weekend is that there are things you're like oh man i don't want to do this so you're going to procrastinate it but if it's on the calendar like this is the day i got to work on this and you're like well this is today it's on the calendar no one but this is what i got to get doing so that 
that's one big thing to you know keep you on track and then uh, just kind of doing what you have energy for there's some things that are harder to do so when i have a lot of energy i'll do them and then there'll be other days where i'm you know kind of burned out and that's where i'll just do um you know level design or maybe bring in new characters or make more because i produce the music for the game too so i'll just you know make music when i have less energy and then uh you know, talking to influencers that you could do anytime you're on your phone. So I work like an office job and sometimes I have to wait for the computer to load. So well, then I could be on, you know, Twitter, talking to people and making connections, things like that. Or, you know, if I'm away somewhere waiting in line, the DMV or some other place, I could be browsing the Unity Asset Store, finding models. So you just kind of squeeze it in wherever you can, like whatever you're able to do, do it at that time. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, you contacting influencers and publishers uh, who are outside of your uh, scope of development, I, I would say. Um, first of all, did you, were you apprehensive before you contacted them? And do you find that the response you got was, uh, more, po I mean, w was more positive than you thought was going to happen? Yeah, it's generally pretty positive. Actually, publishers I personally haven't contacted, but I had um, just from posting on Reddit, on Twitter, things like that, I've had publishers like contact me. And actually, the one that I'm working with right now, the people I'm doing their tech demo for, um, they kind of put me in touch with this publisher that, is, you know, hopefully I can, you know, work out something with them to get, get it out faster. And then uh, that publisher is actually the one that's reaching out to Sony for me. So that's, uh, I put an application for Sony's developer program. And still haven't heard back like they're infamous for just taking forever so i'm hoping with like the publisher they'll have a little more pool but they're actually hoping that sony will co-fund the project which uh they think there's a good chance of happening i don't know maybe <laughs> but uh i guess i guess things take time especially when you're talking about someone like sony uh they probably have so much red tape uh so many different departments they have to go through yeah. so uh you know of course on doubtfully it's going to take time uh, you know, for, for those guys, you, you, you never know. You just give it a try and, and see what happens. So I guess this was more of a six degrees of separation kind of story where uh, you, you, you took a project on with someone and then they recommend you to someone else and then it, it went from there. What, what about uh, the influence side, influencers side? Did they uh, contact you mostly or did you have to go and contact them? And if you contacted them, uh, you know, actually... Uh, from from your Reddit uh, post, did you think you were going to have so much, uh, you know, positive feedback from from what you had posted? Well, I was, I was pretty surprised about that. I mean, I knew people that were, you know, into like VR were going to like it because, you know, I'm into VR and there's nothing like that out there. And it's if it's something I really want to see, I figure other people are going to want to see it. But what I was like kind of surprised about was the amount of, um, yeah, like professional level people like the people that got in contact with me to make this tech demo they you know helped design the xbox and playstation controllers and they worked at like nvidia for 30 years and um it's crazy and then on twitter some of the people following me they've been they've worked for rockstar and like all these you know ubisoft like all these big companies and it's like wow these people that worked on all these things that you know these games i grew up playing now they're interested in what i'm doing so i thought that that was pretty cool and that was you know pretty crazy <laughs> How, how do you deal with that when these kind of people, uh, I mean, unless you're used to it and you're used to interacting with those kind of level of people already, um, I don't know whether you are or, or, or not, but how did you deal with that kind of attention? Uh, I think uh, if you are going to actually, you know, get it, well, I, of course, you know, I, thank you, thank you so much. Like, <laughs> that's a big one. But uh, yeah, when, once you are start working with, you know, people and professionally, it, uh, you know, I, I didn't have any problem telling, you know, I've only been doing this seriously for about a year. Like I have other prior experience, but, you know, this I'm fairly new to. And uh, yeah, they're all pretty understanding. And uh, and yeah, they're all really impressed. Actually, <laughs> like when I was sending them stuff, I, I was thinking like, oh, man, I'm taking forever to do this. And there's barely anything in there. And then they get in there like, oh, wow, we're blown away. You did this so fast. And so, uh, yeah, it's a. So you find that there's a like camaraderie between uh, in, in those relationships. Yeah, definitely. And it definitely helps to tell them that you're new so that if they use some kind of words or jargon and you don't know what they're talking about, you could be like, wait, what is that? And then, uh, yeah, and they're, everyone's really been, been nice about it. Like, you know, understanding that I don't know everything, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a good, it's, it's, I've always had, I've had fun working with, you know, different people like that.
Cool. And what, what, what did you learn from those guys? Or what are you learning from those guys? Oh, uh, well, um, one person I'm actually working with actually works for Unity. So he's just dropped all kinds of knowledge on me. He knows a lot about how I had, you know, because I had to send him the project. He was the one to help me incorporate like the norm core, the multiplayer. So I learned that from him. Um, and also just lots of little like ins and outs about how to make Unity work faster. Like there's, you know, files that you can put, you know, in certain folders and now they won't like load up every time Unity comes up. Different little weird works like that. How, how do you go about doing the music? Because music can be something that uh, gets flagged on YouTube. <laughs> the one thing that gets flagged after three seconds is music. Yeah, so with the music, um, when I was first wanting to like put the soundtrack in, I was like, oh, I want something kind of inspired by the Samurai Champloo like soundtrack. And I found a guy that did something kind of similar to it. And so I talked to him about licensing his music and he was like, oh, you know, I'm going to give you this amazing great deal because I like your game so much. And he's like, $50 a song. And I'm like, oh, man, that's like $200 for four songs. Like, I could buy a lot of models with that. So I was like, you know what? I, I've, you know, played in bands before. I've, you know, mixed our, you know, music before. Maybe I can just produce my own. So I started going online. I bought kind of sound sample packs, like basic mm -hmm. beats. And then uh, I found a lot of Oriental sample packs, like Sam Shin and like those Asian guitars and things like that. And I ended up started mixing it and, you know, trying to listen to other songs in like the lo-fi genre and kind of copying them. And so I actually ended up uh, producing my own music. It's a lot cheaper wow. and able to get exactly what I want. And uh, that's yeah, amazing. It's coming together really well. Like, it, it, I mean, that, that's no, but that is amazing that you have all those, all those skills because producing music is no easy fleet. And if you don't know how to do it, uh, it can take hours, days, weeks you know, to, to put the beat and, and they, I mean, do you use like Cubase? I mean, what, what kind of software do you use for, for your so, music? Yeah. So I use, um, I started off using one called like Music Maker, which is kind of more for beginners. And right. as I got into it, I started realizing some of the limitations of it. And then from there I upgraded, there's one called uh, Acid Music Studio and that's what I use. And um, I don't, I don't, it's probably not like an industry standard or something, but it has all the little bells and whistles. So that I'll go out on there. And then there's the, uh, another program called Splice. Mm -hmm. And that's actually like a subscription service where you pay like $7 a month and mm -hmm. they give you like 200 credits. You can go and use it to get like samples. So I'll use that to get different like noises that I use to mix and make songs. So you'll be able to release a, a music pack as well, I guess. Yeah, I'm probably gonna have like a, the soundtrack come with it. And actually the, the game soundtrack is already available to listen to on uh, Spotify and Amazon Music and iTunes and uh, pretty much yeah, all the major music distributors all been sent to so you can listen to it on there as well so how many songs did you end up composing uh right now in the soundtrack and it's still in a work in progress there's uh i want to say about 16 songs right now wow that's a lot of songs and, and each one is how long like three minutes or a minute i mean how long are they yeah, they vary. I think the shortest one is about two minutes, and I think there's shortest one is two minutes. Yeah, <laughs> and there's oh a couple, my god, <laughs> a couple longer ones. Cause some of them, um, I mean, because it is just like instrumental and background, it can kind of go on for a while. But I think, I think I have ones up there around like five minutes, or like the longer ones. Okay, um, your best three tips for for getting into developing an app. So best three tips would be um, don't afraid don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money. Whether that be on tutorials, assets, you know, whatever it is, don't be afraid to spend a little bit. And then, um, and I would say, you know, don't be afraid to top into it. Don't spend too much time researching. Some people are like, oh, I'm going to make a game, but I'm looking up this and looking up that. You know, don't worry about that. Download Unity, get your tutorial and follow it. You know, pull in your SDKs, just get started. Um, don't worry about researching too much. You know, if you if you try Unity, you don't like it, you want to switch to Unreal, there's no 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 friction and now you could do it, you know, just just get into it. No, no, don't don't give yourself excuses. <laughs> and then uh, my last tip would just be um, you know, make, make think about making your game look good like right away in the beginning. I know a lot of times, you know, you're prototyping, a lot of things aren't gonna be final. So they're like, oh, let's just leave it with pill capsules and we don't need effects, but if you throw in those little particle effects, the screen flashes, or you know whatever those little little bits of pizzazz, that's what's going to get you that attention early on from like you know publishers and media, and that's going to help you build up a following and uh, you know make connections sooner. 